Hey man, how's it going? Good, buddy. How you doing? Good, good. It snowed the other day here, which was pretty cool. That sounds a little, disgusting. A little, a little dusting. Yeah. It, it melted, you know, right when it got on the floor, but or on the street. But it's pretty cool. It's been really cold over here, dude. Why don't you tell me that California gets cold? <laughs> As if you do. <laughs> yeah. I honestly Just, don't. I know I lived here for a couple of years, but I don't remember it ever getting below like 60, except like sometimes at night. Really? But now it's like during the day. most of that time then. I yeah. feel like every year there's a couple of weeks where it gets into like the the 50s and 40s. Well, at least, I mean, as long as it's only a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. There's going to be a huge uh, winter storm here apparently on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So I guess the day after this comes out, um, they're telling like all of the restaurants that they need to secure all of like the outside dining equipment. <laughs> You know, some of these people have like right. these really intense, like Patty built wood, insulated, yeah. um, wooden, like on the street. And mm-hmm. they're saying that you need to secure it, blah, 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 because there's going to be a big snowstorm. So it'll be interesting to see how it fares, you know, to see what actually happens, um, <laughs> if any of it makes it. But they also said that they can't have outdoor dining if the snow is like going to be more than two inches or something. I can't remember what, but not that I mean, many people would be outside anyway. Yeah, anyone who, I mean, I feel like they should have outdoor dining if the snow is above two inches. And anyone who's out there should be rounded up. <laughs> and <laughs> Put in an asylum. Put in some sort of asylum. Yeah. Yeah. Or like send somewhere to be put to use. Like just send them to like those science bases in Antarctica. Yeah, they can handle it. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. There was this one, I don't know if we talked about it before. Uh, I talked about it with someone else. Was uh, There was this steakhouse in Midtown that had outdoor dining. They had done one of those like professional tents where it's like really heavy, like plastic drapery around. Right. Kind of like what you find at a wedding or something. And they covered the entire sidewalk outside of their... Uh, building outside of their restaurant and Mm then uh so then they had like the street they had uh let's say like eight feet of sidewalk and then they had a little pathway to go through it and then they had like six feet of uh tables and like the host stand and you had to walk under a tunnel in between all of these diners without masks on in order to like go on the sidewalk right and it's just like, how, how did anyone ever think that was a good idea? When what was that ever thought of? the difference at that point? When you have like thick plastic tents? No, I agree with you. sounds like a the whole thing is just ridiculous. like marinating <laughs> fucking yeah. session. I mean, we have cops going around like having all of these, you know, more and more police brutality and shootings and stuff in New York City, but they can't find the time to like, enforce regulations that actually save lives yeah stop stop the infection stop the outbreak yeah you know yeah i mean i was saying last week that the sheriff in this county orange county said that he's not going to enforce any of the stay-at-home orders any of the lockdowns or social distancing laws or uh orders that they put out and uh but they're out here uh evicting people Police assisted yeah. evictions are all over the place. It's ridiculous. Like they're coming in with sometimes with like, um, like riot police because they know like communities are going to react badly, especially yeah. up in LA and stuff. Did you see uh, in Portland? Oh, uh, yeah, that was video? beautiful. That, that was, was beautiful amazing. Sight. The whole yeah, community came LA out and just too. kicked the cars out. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. I that mean, was awesome. To be in Portland, honestly. 
I don't think any of my neighbors would give a shit if I was being evicted. Yeah. It's hard though. You know, it's hard. Like, I feel like not very many places are oriented that way. Like, like the idea that you would stick up for your neighbor or whatever. Yeah. 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 Especially in New York city and most buildings, like I can't imagine, you know, I feel like the culture is like, if they're being kicked out, there was a reason for it. So yeah. how can I help get them kicked out or something, you know, cause nobody actually gets to know their neighbors here. Yeah. I remember when I was living in New York, when the pandemic started, I tried kind of reaching out to a couple of my neighbors to talk about maybe meeting or having like a, like a message group to discuss rent strikes. <laughs> and no one was having like no one gave a shit and that yeah. was a problem like the apartment i lived in it was like half like old people who have been living in harlem their whole lives and then half like like gentrifying kind of college students like yeah. young people yeah. and it's like the young people would never i think do shit like that i mean they have the money you know yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I've never been in a position where that's even a question. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, welcome everyone to the season finale, season one, episode six. It's been fun. Uh, I think I've learned a lot, 100% for me. Um, it's been a fun experience. Yeah. But we're looking forward to coming back in the new year, taking a little break. And then hopefully you'll see some changes. I know our goal is to start bringing on guests and stuff like that eventually. So we'll see when that happens. We're going to get Noel on here one day. Get Juno. <laughs> stuff like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so to start off the season finale, I wanted to jump into news this week. You know, like really getting into things that popped out. Things that caught my eye. Um, the first thing, and I think the, the craziest considering all of the talk around the new uh, Supreme Court justice, by uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and how they thought that she would be like electioneering for Trump, is that the Supreme Court actually threw out, like just laughed a court case from Texas out of the court, saying that Texas has not demonstrated a judicially cognizable interest in the manner in which another state conducts its elections. I mean, is that just a fancy way of calling the other person a moron? You know what I mean? Like judicially cognizable interest. Like there's no actual like logical reason for anything that they brought up. Yeah. It was unsigned too, I guess. But, I mean, that's what we, I think that's what we see that some of these institutions are actually holding out, you know, Yeah. fortunately. But I mean, the concern here is with someone like Amy Coney Barrett and honestly, the, all of the precedents um, and sort of laws and expectations that have been both created and destroyed in the last four years mm -hmm. uh, is that what happens when a more adept authoritarian comes along, right? Like what we see here is, I mean, let's be honest, it's funny, right? Yeah. We're laughing at it, but we need to call it what it is. It's an attempted coup, right? Yeah. There's nothing less than that, just by definition. Uh, and it's bad and they're clumsy and dumb and it's like stupid, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, even so, even like, you know, people in the in the courts, ju conservative, I would say authoritarian judges, considering their history, like uh, Amy Coney Barrett, they have nothing to work with. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. at some point it's a uh, diminishing returns. Right. Like mm -hmm. you can only go so far. Yeah. You know, yeah. it reminds me when you bring it up like that, it reminds me of those movies with like, uh, like. Uh, like a hostile takeover on Wall Street. And it feels like the Trump administration like thought that they would be coming out with this, like, you know, maybe Trump himself thought they were going to have this like crazy hostile takeover, like through the courts. 
And it just turns into like a comedy where every right. lawyer is coming up with bullshit. Like, you know, all of the, the whatever. Yeah. All of the different subsidiary companies that are supposed to buy up stock in this one company to give this one person power just end up buying like stock in all the wrong companies or they can't like log on to their stock accounts or something, you know, just something comical. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, it seems like that a strategy was to have this kind of coup, this hostile takeover, uh, using the same, using the system itself, but having completely baselessness. But if you had, I guess, a better uh, team, it, it is possible for it to actually turn into something nasty, like you said. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you uh, consider all the coups that America has uh, orchestrated abroad, they usually tie incumbents um, to like some sort of corruption crime, you know, like they did in Brazil and yeah. um, Venezuela and Bolivia um, yeah. or to some sort of like murder, you know, like sh- like their soldiers murder someone and then the leaders get blamed for it, like some shit like that. Yeah. yeah. None of that here. Here you just have crazy drunk people showing up to court saying, they saw someone drive up in a van with a bunch of uh, papers, <laughs> boxes, which seem like ballots. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. Joe Biden's campaign literally drove up to the polls in broad daylight in a marked van with Biden's name on it, wearing Biden shirts. And they started filling out fake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, but you see, that's a problem here. Trump has packed the courts, right? Yeah, has packed the courts with with extremely conservative judges, authoritarian judges. Amy Coney Barrett pretty much saying that, um, you know, I mean, her what in her short time as a federal judge, right? We have to remember that Amy Coney Barrett does not have much experience as a judge. Uh, she was appointed to a federal judge position for a few months. And a Federalist Society backed her knowing that she was likely to be one of the top candidates to be put up in the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Um, and her short time as a federal judge was terrible. You should, I encourage people to go read some of the decisions that she made mm-hmm. and the sort of implications they had in labor and race and all of that. But I mean, I'm worried about. I'm worried about someone more competent than Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani coming along and using what they left these judges, right? Yeah. Uh, to actually be successful. Yeah. No, hundred percent. hundred percent. And it's happened before, right? I mean, it's happened. I think we have a short memory. 2001 or 2000 was literally a coup, right? George Bush lost the electoral vote and and the popular vote and became president. It's as simple as that, right? It became a polit a political matter, a highly. I mean, it became a highly politicized legal matter, uh, and pretty much judges uh, appeased George Bush in the Supreme Court, mm. and he became president. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I always wonder what would have happened if Gore was around for, you know, 9-11, what his response would have been. I don't think it would have been too different. Well, 9-11 would have never still... happened because Bush did 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's fair. But, um... Talking about the war, though, I mean, this week they passed the uh, $700 billion defense bill. Mm-hmm. Um, while the rest of us are figuring out where to get our unemployment checks and, you know, whether or not all these people are going to be evicted and with all these unemployment benefits running out. Um, so that, you know, I guess that was predictable that, like we said last week, that the only thing that, you know, Democrats or Republicans agree upon is funding the military. Right. Um, and it's an increase in budget. I think seven yeah. billion sounds like more than before. But I, I wanted uh, to take one point out of it. Yeah. Um, so Rand Paul, like as usual, filibusters it. You know, the one thing that I agree upon with with Rand Paul is that we need to yeah. we need to reduce the defense budget. Um, and 
I wanted to talk about like the filibuster itself because that's been up a lot uh, recently in the news. Like, mm-hmm. you know, everyone on one side wants to take the filibuster out of the Senate and everything like that. But I mean, there is possibility for someone to use the filibuster to stop bad legislation, you know, like it has been used in the past, just as much as it's possible to use it uh, for good, for bad, le- for good legislation. Wait, who wants to get rid of the filibuster? I haven't heard about this. Most Democrats and stuff. Wait, that makes no sense. The Democrats are the ones who got rid of the filibuster for uh, federal appointees, right? Which is exactly what made it so easy for Trump to pack the courts and pack the Supreme Court. Yeah. So because we got rid of the filibuster in 2000, um, the, the, not we, sorry, the establishment Democrats got rid of the <laughs> filibuster in 2016, 2015 was in response to Mitch McConnell's obstruction of the Garland nomination. Mm. And uh, we, I mean, I thought that we all agree that that was a terrible idea because now Democrats aren't able to use it in order to obstruct uh, the packing of the courts, uh, the unprecedented packing of the courts that we've seen this last couple of years. Yeah. No, they want to get rid of it so that, um, like specifically so that Republicans can't use it to obstruct, um, like regular legislation. I mean, it just seems like a very short sighted thing because it's going to be used. It's going, it's going to eventually be one of the only avenues um, of resistance that Democrats have yeah. in the house or in the Senate. Yeah. To me, um, it seems like, sorry, to me, it yeah. seems like the ability of the minority. And we talked about this, how the Democrats are like the worst opposition party in history Yeah, and how the Republicans are the best. And it shows you. And the great thing about having a opposition party is that it, it creates critiques of the current administration mm-hmm. and the current power. And you need that. And you also need a check on the current power. Right. I mean, it's kind of like the logic of Obama expanded the powers of the presidency to conduct like foreign affairs. Right. Just as Bush had done it before him. And that leaves all of this room for Trump to do it and then for Biden to do it. So it's the same thing. Like you give people the power to to stop, like you know, in this moment to stop Republicans from obstructing you. But in the next moment, they you can't use it to obstruct them. Right. Um. Yeah, the I mean, only way a tactic like that would work is if the Democrats were, if they were the Republicans, pretty much. I mean, <laughs> if they were as like as like Machiavellian and yeah. sort of unabashed, like yeah, yeah. the Republicans. Now we saw reports that Trump is making it harder for Biden to undo his executive orders and to um, to sort of fire the sort of uh, bureaucratic the bureaucratic uh, apparatus that he set up, right? Mm-hmm. By mm-hmm. making them, making a previously appointed positions into self-servant positions, right? Mm. And pretty much giving them a sort of job protection of these like really fanatic people that he's put in all over the government yeah. that are going to be sort of speed bumps for anything Biden can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was that? Where was I going with that? I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, the Democrats. If the Democrats were to be like the Republicans in that in that respect, if they were to say get rid of the filibuster now that they're able to, and then right before they're out of power to to reinstate the filibuster <laughs> with protections to make it more difficult, like that's something the Republicans would do. But yeah, the Democrats 100%. would never do. They would no. say, "Oh, fair is fair," you know. <laughs> You know, we're all playing by the same rules. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And then, um, oh, I was going to say, oh, so Mike Lee, he blocks legislation to create uh, a national uh, museum in the Smithsonian for Latino Americans. Right. Uh, and he argues that the history of Latino Americans and women, um, oh, I'm sorry. It establishes national museums dedicated one to 
Latino Americans and the second to women. And he says that they should all be a part of American history rather than in a separate museum. Because the last thing we need right now is to further divide an already divided nation within an array of separate but equal museums hyphenated of hyphenated identity groups. At this moment in the history of our diverse nation, we need our federal government and the Smithsonian institution itself to pull us closer together, not further apart. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. It's like this like weird thing that the Freedom Caucus does, which like turns he just, previous like separate but equal shit against yeah. against the people who got rid of it. He just called giving or establishing a museum to celebrate uh, Latinx Americans and women Jim Crow. Yeah. This is what he done. That's Jim yeah. Crow. Yeah. Because it's it's the same thing. Right, it's the same thing, yeah. <laughs> right. Creating this will oppress the groups. Creating this will create a divided nation. And it's yeah. like, do you really think that it's going to in any way impact how divided our people really are at this moment? Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, it's... Uh, I don't know. This no, guy's a bit it's much. nothing. It's a it's another grievance that he can go back and you know talk about or go on Fox News and be like, you know, it's really the Democrats who are racist. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I don't see color. Exactly. Mike Lee doesn't <laughs> see color, guys. <laughs> Everyone's an American to Mike Lee. Colorblind. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, but one of the craziest things for, for me this week was seeing the news of the, uh, the BMW that drove through like protesters in Manhattan. Oh, New York. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the story goes, if you haven't seen it, that this woman's driving down the street, her car gets surrounded by protesters and a few of them start like slapping the windows of the car and. Um, you know, and then all of a sudden she like just gasses it to get out and then just like runs people over, runs over like delivery people on their bikes and runs over. Well, actually there were, um, people on bikes on either side to like direct the protest. And this was a protest, uh, in support of the hunger strikes of those Mm -hmm. people in ICE detention centers. Um, so this 52 year old woman charged with reckless endangerment and then some of the protesters are charged with like uh something to do with like disorderly conduct um it's pretty gruesome video um really honestly it's quite crazy but it just brought to mind this like you know and i I don't think people are gonna like me to say it but i think there's fault on both sides um because very obviously, and, and I think everyone would agree with this, that she felt like she was being attacked, right? Whether or not that's like what she should have felt, right? She's mm-hmm. feeling like she's attacked. And so she feels like she has to like get out of the situation and she's surrounded. She can't like move. She can't push forward a little bit or they'll start hitting the car. So then she just, just like, like this like instinctual thing just comes and she just like hits the gas, right? Yeah. I don't think she ever wanted to hurt somebody. I don't think like if she was in her right mind, she would say like that she's even against the protest itself. You know, she might even be supportive of it. But the problem is that she was in a situation where she felt her life was under threat. And so I think like the blame lies on her for not being aware of where she is, being in control of her car, being in control of her emotions. But then also the fact that, you know, it's hard for me to say that it's okay for protesters to to surround cars and like start like, you know, not saying in this case, but like in other cases where they're like attacking cars or like, Mm -hmm. like really like hitting cars and stuff. And unfortunately, like this is the kind of stuff that happens when you do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know what? I actually agree with you, but because some people are just bystanders, you know, yeah, so I mean, I think that their lives. I think that. Well, I mean, I don't know about that. 
um, part of it. But I think that people in in protests on on the streets that that there has to be some discipline, right? Yeah, because I mean, what you do has has consequences for the people that you're shoulder to shoulder with, right? Mm-hmm. And I've been in so many situations where I feel like like there is a sort of we don't we want to be organized, right? And our power comes through our organization and our solidarity. And that is hard to achieve when people are acting out of sort of sort of an individual whim, right? Or sort of a mob mentality that arises in any large gathering of people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. you really I this is what we were talking about, the idea of practice, right? Mm-hmm. That people who are out of practice um, sometimes make decisions on the streets that put other people at risk, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not against, you know, surrounding cars and hitting them. Not at all. Um, as long as it is agreed upon, <laughs> right? It is yeah. directed. It is, it is prudent, right? When it's just like randomly, you know, some people in a large group of people are like, um, I don't know, like whenever you go to a lot of protests, you kind of get upset. I get upset when I see like spectators, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's where like a sort of, I don't know, it's almost like a, like an art, it's almost like a metaphor, right? For the struggle. Yeah. Yeah. When we were walking through with BLM in New York, you saw all of these, like, we go to these rich neighborhoods and all of these, like, young people, uh, mostly white people, I mean, uh, to me, obviously, rich or wealthy, well-off, are just, like, sunbathing in the park, right? Mm-hmm. And there's, like, this historic political movement uh, one that it's that is again trying to redeem history and make it going on right next to you. How do you sit there? And it is frustrating, right? Yeah, I would be fr- frustrated if like a BMW was driving like into our crowd or behind our crowd and not respecting uh, sort of our space and our safety uh, in the street. I would be upset too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, it goes to show this situation that that things need to be directed, right? Yeah. When you are at the rear end of a pro of a March and you're banging on car windows, I mean, there's, there could be consequences for people at the front of that March. Yeah. Like Like that's just bad. Yeah. Uh, What I'm trying to say is as, as far as morality goes, I'm always with the protesters, but as far as tactics goes, this was bad tactics. You know? That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, Sorry, I didn't mean to make it all long winded. No, that's that's fair. I guess I'm I'm more on the side of like, you know, if it's something that either affects your life or you're inspired to help, right? And you join a protest or you join direct action, etc. Like you have every right to be there and you should be supported in doing so. But at the same time, it's hard to like give people who aren't affected or who haven't been inspired the like responsibility to become involved or like, like I think at the end of the day, it's the system itself that's at fault. And I think you'll agree with me that like, it's the system that's at fault. And sure, like we as individuals can work to change the system, but it's also unfair to have like, to think that everyone is going to be involved, that everyone is going to like give up their lives to do anything. And I think at the end of the day, I just want to people to be the best that they can be and work for the best that they can work for within the system that we live in. As long as yeah. they're not like actively oppressing other people or actively discriminating against other people. Right. Yeah. Like if you're just living your life under this capitalist society, it's hard for me to think that this woman who grew up in this world, uh, in a privileged state to just like, I don't know. I'm kind of rambling at this point, but you get what I'm saying. I get what you're saying. But I mean, I think that, that 
that any oppression depends mostly on the banality of the majority of people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I see what you mean. Um, and we talked about this with our George Jackson reading. Yeah. Um, and it's something that even Arden Arendt, sorry, uh, Hannah Arendt with her horseshoe theory, um, you know, really admits to is that, is that it's the complacency that's the problem, right? Yeah, I see what you mean. I mean, there's maybe 5 to 10% of Americans, I mean, I don't know, just say, for example, I mean, I would say that might even be a, high, a number too high. But let's say 5 to 10% of Americans actually are capitalists. They are okay with the exploitation of workers as long as they benefit from it. They're okay with U.S. imperialism. In fact, they want it, right? Mm -hmm. And the rest of people are just trying to live their lives. Yeah. And, but the rest of the people is sort of the firewall, right? Yeah. The people yeah. who say like, you know, well, it might not be a great system, but I found some sort of peace and stability within it. And that's what I'm out. That's yeah. what I'm out to protect. Right. Yeah. That's as far mean. as my interest goes. Yeah. Um, and that needs to be challenged. Yeah, I, I don't think it is ethical. Uh, I don't think it's good for a person to live their lives in peace, right? To sort of live their lives trying to ignore um, the harm that is happening around them and the pain that is happening around them. It's, yeah. not only, it's not only bad, I think, but it's sort of dumb because mm -hmm. eventually that pain is going to be turned towards you, right? You yeah. are going to have to suffer it some way or somehow mm. uh, systemically. But that being said, I mean, I agree with you. I'm not going to make this a matter of like sort of individual responsibility or, or individual action. I get that there, are system, that there are systemic incentives in place that have to be uprooted before we can expect everyone to be, you know, marching with us. Yeah. 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 And I guess it, the responsibility is on the protesters to to give reason for people to join. And I know I talk, I I haven't talked about this before, but like you know, the big reason that people become conservatives, I think, is because of this aversion to loss, this loss aversion, the idea that like if things change, then I could lose things, and I could lose my status, and I could lose my wealth, I could lose my peace. In your words, right? And I think yeah. it's up to the left or whoever to make arguments that make sense that come out and say, you're not going to lose like these things, like you've already lost them. Right. Like the middle class argument, like we need to tell people there's no middle class. There's just this illusion of the middle class. Like you yeah. have more random stuff, but, but that doesn't mean that you're any different than someone who has less stuff. Right. right. And I think that's the responsibility. And that's what I think the black lives matter movement did really well was convincing people to yeah. come out, convincing people to come out. And um, yeah, so that's, I guess, what we can do in the future. Um, I know the, the last thing I want to talk about for news for this week was we have a big vote coming up uh, for the House, which is that of the speakership, right? So mm. next year, uh, so obviously um, Nancy Pelosi is by and large the favorite. She is pretty much guaranteed with all of her, um, all of her labors, all of her lobbying to the rest of the members of Congress, which she has done through uh, bringing in the majority whip, Jim Clyburn, who uh, was the big reason that Joe Biden won the, the, um, the nomination. She also brings in a lot of uh, big donors to help squeeze like Democrats with money. And then also bringing in like labor leaders to contact their local congressperson. So really like hammering on these people to vote for her, really bringing her power together. But right now, right, we have a, we have a, a situation where Democrats are probably going to hold 222 seats and the Republicans are going to hold 212. Right now, if even 10 people don't show up for the vote, we could see a Republican take the speakership, even with a majority of Democrats in the House. Um, this could be for COVID. This could be for anything. I know, like the, 
um, the physician, the Congress, Congress, congressional physician, whatever you want to call it, said that we need to have people back on the 27th to make sure 27th of December to make sure that they're like clear to go into the building for like a, mm. July, a January 3rd vote. Um, but I was thinking I've heard some, like I've read some things about how progressives, this could be a movement for the progressive caucus with all of the new members, like um, to really put it on them and say, like, we're not going to vote for you unless we get a vote on uh, the Green New Deal or a vote on Medicare for all, or like these very, very uh, structural things to the movement, right? So I don't know. Um, I think it could be a moment to like really pin it to the to Pelosi and the, and the establishment and kind of show the power, especially with mm. such a slim majority, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if the progressives find, them, find themselves in a position where they can actually obstruct her uh, speakership, that they should go all the way with it. They shouldn't, they, I don't think they should just hold out for some concession. The truth is the best thing that could happen is Nancy Pelosi doesn't get that position. I would yeah. rather have a more conservative Democrat as speaker of the house who is just better at politics than mm-hmm. Nancy Pelosi. Nancy yeah. Pelosi has been an utter failure. <laughs> I mean, she, she, didn't secure anything that the Democrats wanted in the first stimulus bill in the CARES Act, right? Mm-hmm. And when everyone critiqued her, she pretty much said, oh, oh, there will be time for that, right? Extremely condescending. And then she never was able to get it because she had nothing to bring to the table for Republicans, yeah. right? Yeah. And then Mnuchin or whatever offers her, you know, a huge, or I mean, he doesn't offer her. He, he sort of starts speaking about a huge stimulus deal that Trump would back that would put pressure on McConnell if Pelosi signed on. And she mm-hmm. didn't. Right. No, nope. because, you know, she said that she didn't want to give that win to Trump, which at that point is pretty much admitting what we've been discussing all along, that the Democrats are are terrible at messaging. At, yep. at public relations. Yep. And, and so they're pretty much giving up that fight. Like they know that Trump would get that win. Right. Yeah. Uh, As if that would be the case. Yeah. Um, but, and then, so now we're in a lame duck because she didn't want to go with Mnuchin's you know, offer. Mm-hmm. And we're in a lame duck where people cannot expect any sort of aid for at least another, you know, what, two months. Right. Um, and, you know, there's no guarantee that that will even go through with McConnell. Yeah. I mean, the so, most amazing thing about these, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that I don't think Nancy Pelosi should be there at all. Along yeah. with the fact that she promised that she would step down. She said uh, the terms of the condition of her speakership two years ago is that she would step down in 2020. Yep. Right. And here she so, is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the only thing that she's good at is raising money. I think that's what her yeah. and Schumer have in common is that they're good at sucking up to big donors. Right. Right. That's about it. And that's why they're this like managerial class of Democrat. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's why they always come from like New York or California where all the big all donors the big are. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, you know, you saw, uh, uh, or everyone saw that the, the team that's been negotiating the like bicameral bipartisan COVID relief legislation that was going to hopefully come out this week um, had nothing to do with either leader of either party. Like they just decided we've had enough, like we've been under your thumb and we understand party politics, but this is we're after the election. It's time to give money, people, uh, money to people. Right. So I have hopes for that. I think that Trump would push that through. We know he's eyeing the 2024 run. So he could definitely like say like one of my last acts as president was to get this through and Biden did nothing for two years, you know, four years. Um, right. But yeah, that's a good, that's a good plan. I mean, yeah. I didn't think about Trump doing that, but yeah. Um, 
I just don't know. I don't think Trump, I think Trump is too resentful for that. <laughs> like yeah, he yeah. said, he was on Fox news. He was saying 125% of my energy is going towards, uh, towards uh, overturning these phony election results. It's like, dude, yeah. could you at least spare that last 25% for the, for the <laughs> pandemic? Like, <laughs> but I mean, I, yeah. I just think that Chuck Schumer is like sort of feeling the wind. Is that a saying? What do you mean? Like he feels the winds of change or whatever, oh, the okay. way the wind is blowing. Okay. Anyway, and he's been uh, sort of backing these sort of progressive proposals like these la- free, this like, last month, right? Yeah, the debt, like debt the relief. $50,000 relief. And there was a couple others. Um, but Nancy Pelosi has just been belligerent. She's been constantly attacking yeah. and giving a cold shoulder to progressives uh, and failing at her job uh, as, you know, house leader. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the craziest thing for me was when she was on CNN with Wolf Blitzer. I don't know if you saw that, that clip, but she, he asked her like straight up, you have an opportunity. Like you were given a deal and for let's say like 900 billion, whatever the Republicans wanted to do, which would give money to people. Not the like, Republicans, Mnuchin. Mnuchin, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. And, um, and you said no. So like, why are you like withholding money from these people who are going to like, you know, be evicted in a month and all this kinds of stuff? And she got belligerent with him and was like, how dare you? Like, you don't know what's going on in the room. Like, you don't know McConnell. You don't oh, right, know the right, details right. of the bill. Like yeah, there's so much that. crap in it. And it's like, yeah, it's a shit, you know, like this woman is so corrupt. She is so corrupt. Yeah. She is, it's, it's incredible how you have someone who is so utterly tied to donors and we still have a conversation about it, about her having the leadership of the party. Yeah. It is just ridiculous. And this is, I mean, this is the beginning of the progressive movement is like, getting away from donors and saying, this is ridiculous. Yeah. There's, yeah. It's it on and on. very frustrating. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, let's turn now to uh, the segment we're calling Eli's clips of the week. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or Ilyas's clips of the week. Whatever you prefer. <laughs> So uh, the first clip uh, you said was about Biden's call with the civil rights leaders, right? Yeah. This was a leaked audio of Biden with some civil rights leaders. Um, You know, I always wonder how these calls get leaked, right? Like who's leaking? You know, because, you know, a lot of a lot of these leaks are done uh, on purpose. Yeah. Right. Yeah, by like Biden's team as a way of sort of Gaining sending PR. a message, right? Sort of communicating positions mm-hmm. that they wouldn't otherwise on a public platform. Yeah, a lot of these leaks are. I'm like, who who's leaking this? I don't understand. But um, yeah, let's watch it. Yeah, and so there's some things that I'm going to be able to do by executive order. I'm not going to hesitate to do it. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to do what used to. Vanita, you probably used to get angry with me during the debates when you'd have some of the people you were supporting said, on day one, I'm going to executive order to do this. Not within the constitutional authority. I am not going to violate the Constitution. Executive authority that my progressive friends talk about is way beyond the bounds. And as one of you said, maybe you, Reverend now, whether it's far left or far right, There is a constitution. It's our only hope, our only hope. And the way to deal with it is where I have executive authority, I will use it to undo every single damn thing this guy has done by executive authority. But I'm not going to exercise executive authority where it's questioned, where I can come along and say, I can do away with assault weapons. There's no executive authority to do any of that. And no one's fought harder to get rid of assault weapons than me me but you can't do it by executive order if you do that next guy comes along and says well guess what by executive order i guess everybody can own machine guns again 
All right. I mean, yeah. dude. This is why Democrats lose in the long term. This is why Democrats This is why we had a toothless Obamacare. It's because yeah. this guy was in charge of it. Yeah. I mean, the idea, first of all, whether you like it or not, the interpretation of the Constitution in recent history has really opened up executive orders as Mm -hmm. a sort of, um, as a precedent, right? Like it's expected. It's not outrageous. Every president uses executive orders, some more than others, right? Uh, And many of them reverse them in the next term. And many of them reverse them in the next term. That's what happens, exactly. But the idea that, first of all, appealing to a constitution like some sort of Republican in the late nineties. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what are you talking about? The constitution only hope. has, yeah, the constitution has not elucidated <laughs> many of these problems that you're trying yeah. to avoid. Right. Yeah. As ultimately what's happening is trying to avoid problems. The fact that he admits I will use executive orders to overturn everything Trump did. Right. Shows you that why don't you use those orders like Trump did. Right. To give us something good for once, yep. right? Yep. Um, if you're going to use them to overturn them, uh, and I mean, he—I think he sets up a straw man with like assault weapons. Mm-hmm. But what we're asking him is like, is like, stop deporting people, right? Yep. Um, give you know dreamers some protections. Yep. Give workers some protections where you can like like regulatory protections at least yep uh what we're asking for is student debt forgiveness right what so the next the next president's going to come in and and reburden students with debt be like oh i'm overturning this executive order all of you are getting ten thousand (laughs) dollars of student debt yeah like And it brings us to our final point, right? Which is that even if you are against using executive orders, right? uh, To that extent, you should at least threaten to, right? Yeah. Like it should at least be something that your opponents are concerned about, right? Yep. Yep. Because what you have here now is you have this clip pretty much telling Republicans, if you obstruct me, I am not going to do anything about it. Right. Yep. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Right. Yep. Yep. And he's and now he has this clip where if he does anything about it, Republicans will be like, "Ah, oh, look at this hypocrite. <laughs> look at this authoritarian." Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even he admitted it. This is authoritarianism. Yep. Yep. I mean, I don't know. I just think. Uh, what it's do you ridiculous. think about? It? I think. Why well, I, I have a few things. So the first is, I have this voice in my head that says, "Obi Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope." Uh, I don't know if that's in anybody else's head, but nah, the Constitution is our only. I've never seen uh, Star Wars. Oh, uh, um, well, that'll be funny for someone, hopefully. Um, Some nerd out there. <laughs> <laughs> you mean like most most people in America? Uh, yeah, but it it reminds me also of um, the way that. Obama handled Afghanistan, right? Where he goes in and he says, okay, we're going to leave in six months. Mm -hmm. And then the Taliban's like, okay, like, I guess we'll just not do anything for six months. And then once Americans leave, we could just go do things, you know? Right. And it's like, whether or not you agree with us doing things in Afghanistan, right, right, right. Considering the goal was to change Afghanistan, that's the most ridiculous thing you could ever do, do, right? And it's this, it's this establishment academic uh, Democrat that says like, you know, we're going to be um, like righteous on our like, you know, moral high ground. We're going to do things the proper way. We're going to give people like notice of our intentions or whatever. And then you go against someone dirty, like a Republican and they're like, okay, like <laughs> I'll have the presidency in four years. Like, I didn't know you wanted Trump in, uh, in another four years. Let's go. Like, I'm going to spend, you know, three months talking about this one call and then Mm. you're done. Um, This is exactly what we talked about with George Jackson. Liberals, right. Are, and you know, it's brought up in Fanon and Sartre brought it up. We talked about a couple, or we brought up a couple of times is that, is that liberals are sort of the firewall 
to fascism Mm -hmm. because as liberals are always trying to uphold order, uh, uphold institution, uphold, uh, uh, what's that word? Decorum, right? Is that the word? Decorum. Decorum. Trying to uphold sort of decorum and civility. Against the obscenities of the right. Right. And while they're trying to do that, while that's all they emphasize, the right doesn't care, right? Yeah. Yeah. The right is okay with throwing all that stuff in the fire. They don't care. Yep. Yep. And so, and so you're always sort of giving ground to them, right? Mm -hmm. Little by little until it all falls through. Yeah. It reminds me of those debates where, uh, that Trump had in 2016, where he was like told to be quiet, you know, like, cause before the presidential debates were more about decorum. Right. And then he came in and changed the game. And they're yeah. like decorum, decorum. And then he just keeps talking. He doesn't care. Yeah. But he's so popular because of that, because he like breaks the mold. And then yeah. now in the next elections, you see Democrats and Republicans doing it. Um, and so, you know, there's a little bit of obscenity in the, in the primaries. But once you get it to actual governing, it's like, no, we're going to hold the moral high ground. We're okay. It's, it's going to be fine. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think one thing... I mean, many things unite them, but another thing is that unites the sort of Bernie movement and the Trump movement in 2016, you know, Mm -hmm. up until now is a sort of being exhausted with the tradition of politics, with the sort of uh, the ceremony of politics, right? Like we don't, we're, we're tired. I think everyone is tired of hearing the way that politicians talk, uh, acting the way they do, right? When people are struggling, when people are immiserated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, politicians acting like the all they need is one more year of power, and yeah. then they're going to fix all your problems, and hearing it every single year. Yeah. yeah. Always change through these processes. It's too slow, all right? That's what everyone's yep. telling you. It's yep. too slow. Yep. We can't wait anymore. No. Yeah. And let's, uh, one of the things that he brought up was that he's like equating the progressives to the far right by saying like, whether it's the far mm. left or the far right, there's a constitution. Right. And it's like, he thinks that like Trump is equal to the progressives as if the progressives are trying to do anything. But like, it's also ridiculous that he thinks that the progressives are trying to thwart the constitution. Yeah. Like, that's the that's the funniest thing that I've recognized um, from becoming a leftist is that the left goes out of its way to learn about the world and to find a way within it in the ways that they can, right? Mm-hmm. And you see this in the debates between like Zizek and Peterson is that the right just does not do the same thing. Yeah, They have their own beliefs. They're going to learn about their own system and they're going to change the system to the way they want it to. And that's going to be right. There's right. no respect. And it goes back to this. Okay. So yeah, it's funny. Cause you're like equating progressives with that. And it's just ridiculous. And I think this goes yeah. into the next clip, which um, was where Biden says that Republicans use the phrase to fund the police to beat the living hell out of Democrats. Yeah. So this was a good one. Let's watch yeah, this. Yeah. Let's watch this one. One of the things I'd be concerned about, just as was pointed out to me that, You wanted me to be concerned, Derek, I think it was you said it, about, you know, uh, um, uh, dealing with uh, Vilsack as uh, in uh, in terms of of, uh, agriculture. Well, first of all, you can learn more about Vilsack's record. But my point is this. I don't think we should make that a big issue going into before January 5th, when the election takes place down in in uh, um, uh, in, uh, Georgia. But I also don't think we should get too far ahead of ourselves on dealing with police reform in that because they've already labeled us as being defund the police. Anything we put forward in terms of the organizational structure to change policing, which I promise you will occur, promise you. Just think to yourself and give me advice whether we should do that before January 5th, because that's how they beat the living hell out of us across the country saying that we're talking about defunding the police. We're not. We're talking about holding them accountable. We're talking about giving them money to do the right 
things. We're talking about putting more psychologists and psychiatrists on the telephones when the 911 calls through. We're talking about spending money to enable them to do their jobs better, not more with more force, with less force and more understanding. But that's, I just raise it with you to think about. How much do we push between now and January 5th? We need those two seats about police reform, but I guarantee you there will be a full-blown commission. I guarantee you it's a major, major, major. Well, I think Joe Biden is forgetting something when he says they use that phrase, defund the police to beat the living hell out of us. Joe, you won. (laughs) <laughs> like what are you talking about you won man yeah and you won georgia yeah right like yeah. there is absolutely no evidence that defund the police the idea of defund the police uh hurt the democrats right mm-hmm. there's no evidence in fact we talked about when blm protesters burnt down a precinct in Milwaukee, the majority of Americans said it was justified. Yep. Like there is no, like, I think he is at once underestimating sort of the support that BLM and defund the police have throughout America or police reform in general has throughout America. Yep. Especially in Georgia and Atlanta. Yeah. Right. And at the same time, playing this go slow game again, right? Where we saw leading up to the election, uh, any concern that progressives had, it was, you know, oh, right. We're in the middle of an election right now. So, you know, let's, we'll, we'll talk about this in a few months now. Oh, we're in the middle of runoffs, right? And then it's going to be, oh, it's midterms, you know, midterms are coming up. They're only a year and a half around the bend. Mm-hmm. There is always going to be an election, all right, yep. around the corner. Yep. And you cannot deal with this by not talking about things, right? Yeah. By putting things yeah, on the yeah. back burner because there's an election coming up when there's an election every year, right? It doesn't make sense. You need to find about uh, find ways to discuss them openly. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And incorporate them as a part of your platform uh, in a way that uh, that doesn't hurt you, which I think many BLM leaders, civil rights leaders have done. And Joe Biden's sort of behind. on, Right. Yeah. It's this like play to like play not to lose mentality. I feel, you know, it's it's like if we don't bother people. If we just hit on those issues that are generally accepted, that don't really push Republicans away, it's like we can win. Mm. But the whole strength, like you said, the whole strength of the movement of anti-Trump and pushing out this Dem win and possibly flipping the Senate was all based upon this aggressive movement, this aggressive movement saying, no, we want these things. Right. We want like re- we want to restructure the police. We want to restructure uh, health care, education. Right. We want to do all of these things. But, yeah, like you said, like once he gets in power, he's just the man of appeasement. And it's yeah. what you saw. Like I said before, it's what you saw with Obamacare. Right. He touted that he was the one in charge of Obamacare, the one that went to the Hill and like really dealt with the leadership. Right. And look what you got. You got a toothless bill that largely failed. It did help, you know, millions of people get insurance, but it did so in an incredibly inefficient manner. It didn't reform the system. It's still a mm-hmm. broken system, right? Um, the only things that are going to stick from it that that are generally accepted now, which is incredible, is the, um, you know, you could be on your parents' insurance until you're 26 and the pre-existing conditions, right? Right. But the rest of it is just is just crap. It's just yeah. like hand me down crap that they got through to say that they did something, right? And I think this is just gonna be the next four years, right? And now we're hearing talk like there were these uh 
things that came out that were suggesting that Biden isn't going to put any of his other Democratic primary challengers in any cabinet or high profile posts because he wants to have uh, Kamala be his successor and to say, like, you know, we want her to take up the lead and we don't want to give any of her potential challengers the airtime or the authority. We don't want to give them secretary of labor. Right. Right. Um, Just or, playing politics. Whatever. Exactly. Exactly. I um, mean, I so. think this, appe- this sort of uh, appealing to some sort of imaginary center, yeah. which has never existed, I don't think, but most definitely does not exist today. Yeah. Right. Um, this is the same, this is the sort of same reaction to progressive movements that have always come up in American politics. You can find articles from um, the civil rights era or the um, civil war era of, of journalists saying that abolitionists were sort of too fervent, right? Abolitionist mm-hmm. speakers were too fervent. They were too, uh, too dramatic. And they're not being practical, right? Mm. They're not realizing yeah. the difficulty of, you know, American politics. Same with the yeah. civil rights, the civil rights era. Many uh, pundits, many politicians, and uh, all um, argued that the civil rights message uh, and desegregation message was hurting their platform, right? Mm. Was sort of making a hard to message. Yeah. Uh, and we have it here too. When, and I think it's really sad. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know what to say about it. Uh, I mean, what makes it what makes it especially sad is at the end of his uh, of this clip, he talks about how defund the police is about is about sort of diversifying uh, city budgets. Uh, and disaster response, right? It's about sort of um, uh, giving police less of a burden, right? Uh, and giving them less responsibilities and creating the infrastructure for other sorts of organizations, other types of responses to problems in a community, right? Mm-hmm. This is a perfect message. I think it's the best way of, of communicating this message uh, in America of defund the police, right? Yeah. So yep. what's sad is that he shows that he has a good message. He knows how to respond when Republicans say, oh, they just want to defund in, uh, the police and they want to abolish the police. He knows what, what to say because he just said it. That's the mm-hmm. response. We don't want to do that. We want to help the police, <laughs> right? Yeah. But at the same time, he's unwilling to use it. He's unwilling to to go through the trouble, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Especially in an era where I live in a city that the uh, police budget is bigger than some nation's armies. Right. You know? It's, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's a bit too much. Maybe Maybe when our police budgets are bigger than armies in different countries, we can say... Yeah, we're good. You know, we're good. And then this last clip is uh, from Bernie. Do you want yeah, to introduce it? On just go in. uh, MSNBC. Oh, MSNBC, sorry. Yeah. You know, Stephanie, I always get a kick. Here in Washington, when we go to war, there's endless amounts of money. Tax breaks for billionaires, endless amounts of money. Corporate welfare, endless amounts of money. When children are going hungry in America today, Suddenly, we don't have enough money. That's crap. That's wrong. And if we have got to stay here throughout Christmas, which is the last thing in the world that I would want to do, we are going to stay here because we are going to make sure that struggling working families in this country get the help they desperately need. Senator, I'm not agreeing with you fundamentally, but I want to talk to you practically. You've been the lead sponsor of 422 bills during your 30 years in Congress but only seven of them have become law. Given that record and how dire things are, as you just laid out, do you need to find another lane or take a different approach here? I don't think that's the issue, Stephanie. I mean, you can ask me how many other senators have passed significant legislation in recent years. 
question is, you could name post offices and so forth and so on. Some of the legislation that I've worked on, the Veterans Bill, for example, has been very significant in passing. But the issue right now is, is the United States Congress going to stand up for working people or not? I just really thought this one was funny because of the little graphic that they made to try to smear him. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> like, this is the same lady who was on, um, on TV talking about how, uh, why, why are progressives trying to, trying to alienate rich people? Why are they trying to turn away from rich people? We need to, we need to all f- be together, right? <laughs> like, but, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. Okay, first of all, to address the smear, if I have to, uh, actually, Bernie Sanders' record, those numbers are, you know, as good as most other lawmakers. Uh, in fact, better than many, better than Nancy Pelosi's, for that matter. Yep. Uh, and uh, Bernie Sanders, ha- the laws that he has passed have been, have been very consequential, right? Uh, especially as a veteran. I would say that I owe him a lot, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because he was on the veteran commission or in, uh, in the Senate. But further, as an independent and as one of the few progressives in Senate, one of the only things he really has the power to do is obviously he can't pass laws as, as, a, as a progressive. But what he does um, is is he amends laws and he has created many, many amendments to bills that have been passed through the Senate. Uh, many amendments. I mean, that's kind of what he's known for doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which she doesn't include. Yeah. But let's get to the f- final message. Uh, she says, I mean, what she meant to say there is that she agrees fundamentally, but she, she doesn't, she disagrees fundamentally. I think is the problem. Hmm. This this call again to practicality is just going off of what we saw from from um, Joe Biden, Biden right? Yeah. The sort of practicality that she talks about has never worked, right? Mm-hmm. And Bernie Sanders actually remains as one of the few people who has respect amongst the Republicans, despite the sort of red baiting that you see in in uh, right wing media around yeah. Bernie Sanders is that he has reached across the aisle many times in order to pass bills that help working people, right? Yep. Uh, what she's pretty much arguing, what she goes on to argue here, is that, is that he's asking for too much and that he's being impractical, right? That it, it never hopes that it, what he proposes doesn't have any hopes of actually passing. But the point is that you don't limit political discourse based off of what your opponents don't want you to do, right? Mm -hmm. When you go into the halls of power, you go in speaking for, you should. I mean, let's all say what everyone hopes for. You go in speaking for what you believe in and what's best for your constituents and the people, your fellow uh, citizens uh, writ large, right? Yeah. And if that has to finally be whittled down through compromise, so be it. But it doesn't mean that you begin your position from an already compromised place. Yeah. That makes no sense. Yeah. Right. That is yeah. not pr- a practical politics. That's dumb politics. Yeah. I mean, it gets at the, you know, I think most, like, especially the mainstream media, but I, I feel like most people I talk to forget the basic structure of the government and say what you will. Like, I think both of us will disagree with the basic structure of a lot of the government. Mm. We disagree with like this concept of like the general will or whatever, the popular will that Madison tried to enshrine. I don't know if Rousseau was after Madison, but the basic concept of like, um, you know, there's like, no, I guess, yeah, that was after that was later constitutions. But what basically what Madison tried to do is to try to separate all of the powers among many different classes of people, right? Rich people, poor people, rural, uh, urban, you know, he put it in the, uh, the Senate, the house, the presidency, the the courts, all of these things to specifically to abstract things and to make things harder to push through, but also to force compromise, I think. Right. 
And the whole point is that everyone should come to Congress. Everyone's elected by their representatives. Everyone's elected or uh, all the people are in Congress are elected by their constituents. And then you come in with your principles. You come in at the height of your power saying that, no, we're going to come out and we're going to try to get this thing. And then, like you said, you go into a room, you figure it out, and then you come out with a compromise. It's mm-hmm. not about, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play until my team's in the majority and then I'm going to win and then I'm going to push everything through, right? Right. That's not what it's about. And I think people forget that in this like age of the two-party like fight, this polarization. And like you said, Bernie is one of these last people who has the respect of lawmakers because he comes in with his principles, but then he walks out with a compromise. Right. At the end of the day, a compromise is better than what Pelosi's done for the last eight months. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, and uh, usually the compromises he walks out with still maintain his principles in them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, and, uh, let's let's clarify what this clip is about. Um, the Democrats have been saying for months and months now that we're going to get a deal. Right. And when people grew frustrated, they said, oh, when Joe Biden comes in, we're going to get even a better deal than you could imagine. Right. Pretty much. They were hyping up this deal. And then what they propose is $600, right? No extension to unemployment benefits, right? Nothing like that. Uh, And $600 for everyone. It's like, what does that do? We we are living in a country where um, where millions of people are more than $5,000 behind on rent. Millions upon millions of people, right? What is $500 or $600 going to do? And all Bernie Sanders is saying here is let's give them 1,200 extended unemployment benefits. And if we can't do it, let's not go on vacation, right? Like, (laughs) and somehow this turns into a smear, right? Is you have this one, probably the only politician in Washington saying, let's skip Christmas vacation if we can't come up with a good deal. Right. And then this lady, why I say it's that she disagrees fundamentally is that this is an ideological decision, right. That she's making instead of seeing this problem, her political analysis, uh, instead of being that, uh, bringing in a Republican and saying, why won't you pass this deal that Sanders and the progressives want for $1,200? Why don't you want Americans to be protected from evictions? Why don't you want Americans to have unemployment benefits in this economic crisis? Instead, she brings on the progressive, right? And says her political analysis is pretty much, oh, Republicans won't do that. Oh, Republicans don't want that. It's like, oh, oh, bravo. Bravo MSNBC yeah. for that cutting edge political commentary. Yeah. Good job. And the crazy thing is that she's wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like McConnell literally offered to drop. Um, he offered to drop, like he offered a compromise. He said, we'll give money to Americans, like direct money to Americans. If we drop state and local aid and I will drop a uh, corporate liability shield, which is what the Democrats were all hung up on. And then they passed on it. They passed Mm. on it. You could have had a bill out the next day. The president signs it. People have money in their bank accounts by the new year. Right. Yeah. But no, dude, I don't want corporate liability in any deal. Yeah. You see, why isn't she talking about that? That should be damning. Like, yeah. Why don't you have Republicans being like, dude, people are starving and going and people are going homeless. And you guys want to make sure that, that uh, corporations don't get sued. You have uh, Tyson, right? Bring up the case in Tyson. The, these managers, these bosses were betting on who would die from COVID, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, the government forced meatpacking to operate through the pandemic without any proper regulation. Donald Trump yeah. did, right? Yeah. Uh, and they're one of the highest infected occupations now and also one of the poorest, right? Yep. <laughs> they're also yep. the ones going to the food lines and they're the ones making the fucking food. <laughs> and you're worried yeah. about corporate, corporate liability. What? Yeah. And, and such as Bernie Sanders. On. That is an ideological decision on behalf of MSNBC and this shill. Uh, and 
and they need to stop pretending like they're at at some sort of center where they're just you know playing practical politics no dude you don't believe in this that's yeah. the problem yeah yeah i agree <laughs> Well, I think with that, we'll turn to our last segment. Yeah. Uh, uh, basically, I want to end up every episode with a call to action. So this week, I wanted to talk about the power of the Sunrise Movement, which for anyone who doesn't know, is a movement um, uh, basically pushing for national Green New Deal, right? This is what um, all of these justice Democrats and these progressives that are Endorsed by them are all like the AOC, the Jamal Bowman, the Cory Bush, um, Ed Markey, right? These Green New Deal people. And I know that you have a lot of experience in direct action. And basically, this article is talking about how we don't need protests, we need direct action, right? And the power of the Green New Deal, of the Sunrise Movement, has been their ability to mobilize young activists mobilize callers to get people to vote for people like Cory Bush and Jamal Bowman, who they endorsed, right? And they actually, um, I forget which state it was, but they actually moved to take over a state legislature with all of their, um, with all of their uh, endorsements. Like mm-hmm. they have the ability to like, they're moving on like a local level, a state level to take over. And we see an organization that is built to train activists, to uh, endorse candidates on every level of government, to stop just focusing on the national, to also focus on state houses, local uh, city councils, boards of education, uh, board of supervisors, whatever you want to call it. And I think we're seeing, you know, we can have these Black Lives Matter uh, protests, we can have these defund the police protests, right? But at the end of the day, what we need is direct action. We need organized efforts, like you've been saying, to move to elect people to, to overturn the system, right? Um, and I know that you've had a lot of experience in direct action, uh, especially when you were living in Oklahoma, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we started some nonprofits that turned uh, unused commercial spaces into, you know, into... Um, um, like shelters yeah places and also you know i was like an anti-fascist and all that i mean i would say that uh protesting is a part of direct action but it has to be continued somewhere right mm. and yeah. whether it's continued in community engagement uh like you know food banks or i don't know uh community policing or or trauma response all that any of that mm-hmm. um uh, it can also be carried on into electoral politics, which I think is what the Sunrise Movement is really focused on, is creating mm-hmm. this bridge from um, local, spontaneous sort of political uh, movements. I don't know what you would call it, gatherings from the streets, right? Yeah. That's what I would yeah. call it. Grassroots. To, yeah. To um, sort of this uh, electoral realm that has long gone uh, unrecognized, I think in its importance is like a more local state, um, um, bodies, right? Yeah. 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 And I think it comes from like, like you said, the, the term electoral politics is such a different concept than I think in the past. Cause I think we all grew up with, you know, if you, you know, if, if you want, uh, an issue to be supported by your congressperson, then like call their office, right? Mm-hmm. Call their office, flood their flood their phone banks. Like this was the calling card for for a few years here, right? Yeah, and that does have its place, just like you said. Like protesting has its place, but at the same time, these Congress people are the reason why things are the way they are, right? These donor um, beholden <laughs> Congress people are the reason that we have this kind of corrupt system. So how do you change that? You change that with a strong, uh, with a strong electoral pol- political campaign, right? Yeah. Getting people elected to office that are entirely of the movement and they're doing a great job of it. And I know that I hope uh, with the, uh, so it's kind of weird, but city council in New York city has their elections uh, this year coming up. 
So they have the yeah. primaries in June. So I know that I'm definitely going to get involved. Um, you know, I get out of school at the end of January. So I'm going to definitely get involved with, with different candidates in the city, hopefully. Um, like, although it's exciting for Yang, Andrew Yang to be a candidate, I think, you know, obviously I'm going to go out and campaign for a progressive. Mm -hmm. Um, it would really be amazing for the city if instead of having another, uh, corporate shill or another, uh, elite driven candidates to really focus on getting progressives elected to the city. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, honestly, I don't know much about the sunrise movement. I feel like they kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah. uh, Caught me off guard, but, uh, but from what I do know, I feel like a lot of its membership and kind of like its tactics is almost like, so the DSA, I was, you know, a lot of people were looking at to be like a workers party, but it was so like decentralized, Mm -hmm. uh, that there was no way of really directing, um, its actions or creating like a sort of unified message uh, beyond sort of like very small regions. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what it seems like, or my impression is that the sunrise movement is sort of like a continuation, not a continuation, but an extension on the DSA where mm. I think a lot of its uh, leadership comes from our DSA members mm. and they're sort of trying to centralize and codify a lot of the things that were learned from um, the DSA project. That's interesting. Uh, I don't know though. I need to know more about it. If you know more about it or if anyone does, you know, yeah. My way. yeah. I mean, it launched in 2017, um, specifically, you know, for protesting and for electoral politics. Yeah. Um, I think that their power comes from their single issue, right? They're saying we want the green new deal and they got a bunch of candidates and supported a bunch of candidates that supported it every single part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, like you said, the DSA was very decentralized. Uh, and we're talking about the, the Democratic Socialists of America, for anyone who doesn't know the acronym. Um, but definitely that organization is much more sparse also in its ideology, I think. Um, you know, DSA? Yeah. Yeah, but that's the because that, they can't agree on one you know, like there's, that's sort what of, I mean. yeah, that's what I mean. And that's why you have, I think, I think the, the, the way to go is to have these single issue organizations that independently act to like endorse candidates and train mm. activists. And so you can have crossover, but at the same time, you know, um, it isn't bogged down by this multifaceted movement that they need to keep hold of, you know? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I feel like that's where when you have all of these organizations giving out, you know, sort of endorsements or presenting strategies and platforms. The problem with that is that a lot of these organizations that, you know, I would call like that I will call generally workers groups, right? Workers Mm -hmm. organizations uh, are going to eventually come into conflict with each other. And compete Mm. with each other, you know? Yeah, I see what you mean. And then they also feed into like almost like a sort of the industry of endorsements, right? Like the industry of political platforming. That's Um, true. So I would, I want to see a very strong, unified, multifaceted workers party. And I look to these, these sort of projects like DSA, like Sunrise, wherever they may start, where, whatever their origins may be, to, I look to them to sort of attempt to grow towards that ideal, right? Mm. You know, yeah. that's what I hope for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. Yeah, well, I guess look for me and Eli out on, the, out on your lawn this election season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I think with that, we'll let it go. Have a good one. Yeah. All right, guys. Have a good yeah. one. We'll see we'll you. We'll see you next season. Next season. Oh, and then I guess we'll have the the Book live club. stream. Um, or the hangout. The hangout. Yeah. yeah. We're rebranding and we're going to be on YouTube. 
Are Come we hang still out. Ben Shapiro's book? We can bring it up. We can bring it up. I'm can done. we please read it? I was so looking forward to reading it. <laughs> I'll read it. I'll read it. We just have that to find the PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Man. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, everyone have a good one. We'll see you later. We'll see you later. See ya. I can't see a